I'm Scott Allen Miller, and this is my daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Today, I've got a couple different viewer questions. One from Mrs. Allie Mack, who wants to ask about what cities they may want to live in. They've got kids, they're interested in the art scene, but ultimately, they think they want to do some homesteading. So that's a little bit different scenario than a lot of you have been looking at. So we're going to be talking about that today. We also have a question, again, about the changing or current pricing of rentals or long-term home properties here in Nicaragua. We're going to get to that afterwards, but all of it we're going to get to right after the bump. All right, welcome to today's show. It is it is still very dry. Those who are looking in the background on my on my videos are like, did the rainy season not come? And actually, it's been raining quite a bit. And I showed some shorts where we had a lot of rain. Mostly the rain comes at night. So you generally see very bright, sunny days. But at night, we're getting a bit of rain. But it does take a while for the ground to reabsorb all the water that it needs for things. So it remains dry for a while, and they mowed here today. So that is a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit just why it looks that way. All right, so Mrs. Allie Mack sent in uh, this question. It starts off with, Scott, this, this channel is amazing and life-changing, and we would not be where we would be today without your chance. Well, I, it's not literal, it's implied. And then she follows up with question. My husband and I are seriously considering Nicaragua as a new home for our family from the U.S. We have four young children, seven, five, three, and one, and my husband will need good internet to work. That part's easy. I'm a professional artist, so being close to an art scene would also be a plus. We would only fly to the States once a year and want to be immersed in the culture. We don't need necessarily uh, to necessarily be in a large city either. Our goal is to be able to homestead in the long run. All the cities look amazing, and we would like to be able to be in a very walkable city where we can homeschool, like we do, and have access to transportation and a house that is safe. Could you make any recommendations? Leon actually seems like a good contender for us. We are just unsure how we'll work to be able to get there and find a place to stay. Would we need to find a real estate agent? We are applying for passports this week and hope to be down there in a matter of months, depending on when they come through. Thanks for all your information. All right, Mrs. Allie Mack. So, yeah, I mean, in reality... Most of Nicaragua is going to meet your needs as long as you're somewhere within reach of one of the major cities. And you have a lot of major city choices here. Obviously, Managua offers certain things. And when it comes to the art scene, the majority of that legitimately is in Managua. And that does not mean that you need to be in the city center. Clearly, from your description, you have no need to be in the city center. And I actually think, so just real quickly, your art scene is mostly going to be in the stretch from Managua to Granada, which is a very small area with the city of Messiah in between. It's basically one extended metro area with just two additional hubs outside of the main city hub. And in some ways, Granada and Messiah actually have more downtown feel and location than Managua proper does. I think as far west as Ciudad Sandino would fall into that zone. You can bring up a map and get a feel for exactly what I'm talking about, but this is a really small area, basically western extent of Managua to its easternmost uh, hub city uh, is going to be your main art scene. And all of that is known for its art scene. Granada has some, it's small, but it's there and with a certain expat presence. Messiah is known for its local crafts. Managua is the capital. So what art scene there is in the country is always centered there. Now, of course, you can go other places and other cities will be welcoming to an art scene, but their art scenes are very small. Leon, Esteli, Chinandega, uh, Matagalpa, Rivas, all of them are going to have something, but you may find that it's relatively disappointing and you'd be working very hard to get into anything that's there. Of course, having some involvement absolutely can happen, but it'll, I think, be a bit more challenging in those areas. That doesn't make it a bad choice, and Leon is close enough to the capital that if it's something you only are looking at doing once a week or maybe twice a month, then it's probably not a big deal to just travel into the capital. Again, public transportation here is very good and easy in a lot of cases, so that may be a perfectly fine option for you. It is worth noting that some places like Leon here have the famous art museum. And of course, being near the art museum gives you an opportunity to hook up with them, get some connections through those contacts and go from there. But overall, I really do think that very likely Managua is going to end up, or the Managua zone, is going to end up being a really good option for you just based on kind of the description. Now, you don't mention, or you do mention that you're not really interested, it seems, like being in a large city, which Managua is not that large of a city to begin with, but it is the major city here. But what's probably more interesting, and it really depends on just the vibe that you guys like, 
But south of Managua, kind of to the east, and this is natural, if you really study the topography of the area, the mountain ranges through that zone actually kind of turn. So to the west of Managua, they run not north-south, but much more towards north-south. And as they get down, they kind of curve and head a bit more east. And because of that, Managua's uh, cultural zone, I'm gonna do my best to show this to you in your direction, it's gonna kind of curve uh, as it comes down. So it starts in the north and goes to the east. I don't know how it's gonna get reversed when I show it on video, it's very confused. I think that I did that right. So when you're thinking of Managua and you go, okay, I'm gonna go into the southern extent of the city, you don't go actually directly south, it's more southeast to understand just kind of how the city uh, tapers out. So that area, which is more directly south of Messiah, is full of beautiful artisanal village, art, artisan villages where uh, you have a lot of people doing crafts, you have a, a decent population density, but in a more wooded, more wild area. It's absolutely beautiful and very, very nice. And the thing that's really nice about that region is that you're very close to a lot of things. So if you want to be within reach of Managua, within reach of Messiah, within reach of Granada, you can be, but you can still be living in a relatively countryside area. And that's hard to beat in a lot of cases if you're looking for a place where you can homestead that those options still exist out there and of course they're a little bit more affordable but you're not getting into super cheap right there's no way to claim that this is the cheap part of the country this is very close to the city so these are premium areas but this is nicaragua that doesn't make them unaffordable by any stretch whatsoever but they are going to be more than if you were coming out to the countryside of leon by far, or if you're going out to the countryside of Chinandega or Matagalpa, all of those are gonna be much cheaper than these areas. You're still gonna be paying a premium for sure because you are easily commutable into multiple cities. That's kind of what you want. And this area will have excellent Everywhere does, but this area will have excellent internet and you'll have the most options throughout this region. Anything that's being serviced directly from Managua has some advantages to just anything like that. Of course, out here in Leon, Chinandega, Matagalpa, all of them have excellent fiber options. So it's not just, can you work from home? Can you get Claro and Tigo and other good internet service providers? Yes, but in all the major cities, you're able to also get Teco, which is the really high end enterprise class fiber carrier. And you are going to pay a premium for that, but we're not talking about massive premiums. But it is worth noting that if you're on a budget that you could be getting away, in many cases, working from home with Claro at like $35 to $45 per month. Uh, and if you're going to Teco, you're probably looking at $80 to $100 per month. But if you're really working, if this is your, your income source, Teco support performance reliability it is excellent i'm not saying there's never an outage i'm not saying i never have to call a tech i'm just saying that when i do they get things fixed fast that you don't have to harass them and when they are coming out they come out and they fix things like they really make an effort at customer service i've been just so thrilled with teco since we've been here and it's worth noting teco is a nicaraguan business whereas claro is mexican and tigo is luxembourgish from europe and they're great we have no problem with that. i use tigo for my cell phone we have claro for different things but Teco is who I recommend when your livelihood or income or business depend on it. It is worth the extra money in nearly all cases. Of course, if you're just using your, your internet for the occasional website, for the occasional uh, you know email, or you wanna make sure that you're able to watch Netflix most times, then sure, save the money, get Claro or Tigo, like landlines, like cable or whatever they offer, get a decent price, save some money, absolutely. But when you need to have online Zoom meetings and you need reliable phone calls to you know different parts of the world and you wanna be able to send big files back and forth and you're really, really dependent on that internet being good, then Teco is worth every penny and is a fraction of the cost of what you would have to pay in the United States. I literally have talked to customers in the United States in the last 72 hours it's probably a little bit more, 96, 72 working hours, let's say that, because it was probably late last week and it's Monday, so I just, as I'm recording this, so we just skipped the weekend. Um, and they were talking about how service at less than 20% uh, of the speed that we get here for 80 to $100 is around 600 where they are in the United States and from a vendor known for bad customer service. Not that they wouldn't get the service, but a fifth of the speed and terrible customer service at six to seven times the cost. That is a massive difference in performance and quality. Like that's just, wow, what, what businesses are struggling to pay for in the United States is so much worse than what you can get for for home here. Like literally you're putting in the kind of things that people would pay a fortune for in the United States. And here it's, yeah, 
for, for locals spending 80 to $100 a month for a normal internet service for your home office, sounds crazy. They would spend somewhere between 12 and $45. That's, that's like pushing the limits. And so this is uh, really a premium service for here, but for someone coming from North America, what a deal it actually represents. Now, Leon does have some advantages as noted in the question. Looking for a place that's safe. This is an obvious factor. You have little kids. So Leon is the safest region of the country. It's really well known for just how safe it is here. Everywhere we go in the country is quite safe. You should, don't need to avoid any major area due to safety concerns. But as a parent, there is a certain amount of, but Leon is just a little bit safer. And if you have that option, that's the kind of thing that does drive parental decision making. Like it just is. So there are reasons that we like Leon more than other cities. And a lot of them are tiny tweaks. And I'm definitely in no way saying that Leon is for everyone. I often say Matagalpa is my personal favorite city to live in. But we have so many friends and things here in Leon. And we love how close we are to the beach, how easy it is to get there. And a lot of people, even some of my regular viewers, just today were like, wait, it's it's right there? I didn't even realize how close it was to the city. I'm like, yeah, it's right there like it's in the city basically it's the only place where the city considers it one of its barrios rather than an associated beach some distance away public transportation throughout the country is excellent this is not generally a problem but there's some places that are going to be better than others with managua and everything that i mentioned the messiah granada area being really good the outlying towns that i'm mentioning the, the white villages the witch villages that goes by both names that are south of messiah um, and are along that band they're above hinotepe above uh, Didiamba, uh, but below Messiah, a little bit below and west of Granada, and definitely below and a little bit east of Managua, that, that section through there, which is just south of the uh, volcanoes, that section is going to have a little bit less public transportation only because they're villages and not the cities, but even there, basically everywhere with a significant population, you're going to have good public transportation. Coming out here to Leon, again, great public transportation. You get farther away, start getting up to Lake Chinandega. Obviously, they still have good public transportation, but the ability to just get into the capital starts to diminish. From here in Leon or anything that's closer than this, our ability to go into the capital and work with whatever resources that are there at the drop of a hat are excellent. If you're up in, say, Esteli, of course, they provide good ways for you to get to the capital. Even Nicaraguans often need to travel to the capital for different things, so they always make sure that public transportation is there to do that for them. But coming from here in Leon, it's much more of a commuter bus. The, the entire system is like, oh, no, we expect you to get up early in the morning, get on the bus, be able to work your entire day in Managua and get home without it being a problem. That's not something that they're doing for farther flung cities. They're more like, oh, you have this very specific thing you have to do with the government, fill out some paperwork, pick up a passport, something like that. Well, we're going to get you to the capital affordably. It's going to take most of your day and you're going to get to go home. Maybe you'll go do some shopping. You'll do something while you're there, but it's a trip. It's an effort. But coming from Leon or closer, we're within a reasonable commuting zone of Managua. And if we were in the United States and put this like directly over top of other places, we would be within the commuting zone of, say, a Dallas-Fort Worth, a Houston, a Philadelphia. If we were to overlay it, you'd say, oh, you're just out in one of the farther suburbs. That's no big deal at all. Here, it feels like you're going a really long way, but it's really just an emotional impression based on the type of highway that changes along the road and the speeds at which we drive. So you really do have a lot of options, but one of them is kind of key, and this is worth coming back to, and I'll do my best to answer it while having to kind of guess exactly what it is you're looking for, but you specifically mentioned wanting walkable cities. Now, this is one where, if this is a sticking point, I don't think it probably is, but it, you thought it was important enough to mention. So let's make sure we dive into it. Some cities like Granada, Leon, Messiah, Matagalpa, Rivas, uh, those cities are going to be extremely walkable, whereas cities like Managua are going to be very unwalkable. Now, if you're me, of course, you can walk around Managua for a lot of reasons. I know my way around. I don't have a problem doing six miles at a shot without even thinking about it twice. I'm a big guy. I have no worry about security, even if I'm going through long stretches of uh, heavy uh, urban density and then areas that are kind of abandoned. Like, I, it doesn't matter, right? So for me, walking all the way across Managua is not a problem. But for normal people, it's not what you would consider a walkable city. It's actually a surprisingly unwalkable city. So of all those factors, most of the things would lean you really much, really much a lot into Managua. But that one factor would really take it off of your radar if that's a significant factor. Plus, you don't necessarily want to be in a big city, you said, so that also would reduce the likelihood. It would go in the con column 
when it comes to Managua. But Granada, Masaya, Leon, we're very walkable cities. Here in Leon, we can walk anywhere we need to go all of the time, and, and you're really in great shape. It is hot, so be aware that some places like Esteli and Madagalpa, Hinotega, they're all going to offer pretty good safety and pretty good uh, resources, pretty good internet, but at a much cooler temperature, which can make them more walkable in that sense, but they're also mountain towns. So they're less walkable in that sense because you have elevation changes as you go through town, whereas here in Leon or in Granada or Masaya, you're pretty much looking at very flat towns, and that means you can walk a lot farther, even though it's warmer, without it being too big of a deal because you're not you're not climbing or anything so we tend to think of those as the most walkable with granada and leon probably the most walkable cities on any scale in the country of course you also have the options of hinotepe and didiamba uh san marcos the mid cities, the Carrasso cities uh, that are south of that Managua, Masaya, uh, white uh, village zone that I was talking about, those are bigger than the villages. Those are actually cities. And again, lots of transportation, but you're farther from the big cities. You have these smaller ones, but they do have their own scene of different things. Both of them are university towns. So you do have a lot of uh, younger students who may be interested in the art scene. You will find some things there, um, but they are very small cities. So if you were to get involved, you would very quickly find that your, your, ecosystem there was very, very small. But you can easily walk around those towns, very safe, beautiful spot in the middle of the country. Nicaragua really does offer you a lot. The majority of Nicaragua will work as, as you stated. The internet access, the safety, I don't know if you said that, the uh, uh, low cost of living, the um, public transportation, all those factors are going to be there nearly everywhere. The, the walkable cities is nearly the most discerning of all the things that you mentioned. And I think if you put in time, what I think is what you're really looking for with that will point you towards Granada and Leon as the main places. And as I always say, in Granada, you very much tend to feel like a foreigner. You tend to feel like a tourist all the time. Even if you've been there for 10 years, you're still going to feel a lot like a foreigner. It's very much an oil and water with the Nicaraguans who live there because there are so many transitory gringos that come through that it just, it just creates a culture of they do their thing, we do our thing. Everybody gets along, but they don't spend time integrating per se. Of course, some people do, but that's the exception, not the rule. Here in Leon, we have a very different thing. We have so many, uh, so many fewer gringos here that, and those that are here are much less likely to be transitory. We have a tendency towards being very long-term or permanent residents. And so when we come here, especially if you live in the barrio like I do, very rapidly we start to have a, oh, people understand that we're wanting to be a part of Nicaragua. We're not here as sightseers. We're not here testing out the waters. We're actually making a decision to be here. This is our home. And we become part of groups of friends and, and a community. And, and we're really involved with where we are. And uh, that, that's a completely different feel. And it depends what you're looking for, which of those is right for you, if either. But those are really big factors that, that Granada maintains a certain amount of feeling like an enclave, no matter what you do. And Leon, I think, combats that heavily. We have so few expats. There just isn't. A, it's very difficult to obtain any level of enclave feel here in Leon um, and most of the cities, right? Granada is unique in that it has so many expats that it can do that. Even Managua may have more expats than anywhere else, but being such a large city, they're diluted within the population and it doesn't have any areas that really strongly uh, scream expat zone. Even if you're going to the Galerias uh, at Santo Domingo or living in Santo Domingo or living in any of that area uh, via Fontana, all those spots, if you live there, you very quickly notice that you're still the exception. And that's one of the great things about living in Managua is that you can be in these big affluent areas and do some really neat things with interesting architecture and whatever. And will there be other expats there? Yes, absolutely. You'll find some. But are they their communities? Is this what the represents them? And it's just a lucky few Nicaraguans who get to participate there? No, no. These are communities that are primarily Nicaraguan. And once in a while, you'll have an expat mixed in. They are places that a lot of expats want to be in. Um, there are some gated communities that lean very heavily towards expats. But in general, you're going to find most of those areas remain mostly Nicaraguan because they're so close to the capital. And the capital doesn't have a tourism draw the way that Granada does. Of course, if it did, that would change the, the dynamic significantly. But it really doesn't. Uh, and that has managed to keep so much of the country its own culture without being overly influenced from the outside. I know I didn't give you a definitive answer, uh, but I think you, you do have lots of options and it's going to come down to just which cities when you get here, 
that give you that that feeling of a place that you want to be. And of course, if you want to homestead, it's also important to explore outside of the city and say, what does this area feel like from a homestead perspective? Because if you're going to be in Granada or the white villages or whatever, yes, you can certainly get farmland out there, but be aware it's going to be farmland in the midst of a lot of people. You're in a heavy population density that happens to have open space. Here in Leon, if you get outside the city center very quickly, you are in endless fields that sprawl out in every direction. And so if you end up homesteading here, you can easily be kilometers from anyone else. And which you prefer is completely up to you. If you want 100 acres, then Leon is going to be much easier. But if you just want one acre and you really want to be able to walk to the neighbor's houses and, and talk to them and have a community while still having a little bit of land, then the middle of the country uh, is going to be a lot more effective that middle being inside the loop of Managua, Messiah, Granada, Hino, Tepe, and Didiamba. It's kind of actually encircled by a lake on one side and mountains on the other. So it's physically kind of uh, a big valley sort of area uh, that is that is super interesting um, and has a lot of resources. So I'm, I'm trying to build enough of a picture so you can get an idea of which places you want to investigate. Um, and basically you have a couple major regions. You have Leon in the west that's going to be really tempting. Shenandega is probably not of interest to you. Um, the lack of the art scene, um, less public transportation, far fewer expats to the point where you'd be very much an anomaly uh, and, and, and more expensive. Um, while being farther from the capital and everything. And of course, you mentioned flying to the U.S. just once a year. That's out of Managua and very easy. No matter where you are in the country, getting to the airport is not a big deal because we all have to use it. So everything's built around that. Leon is one zone. It's going to make a lot of sense. The highlands, that's Esteli and Matagalpa and Hinotega, they could make sense if that's what you're looking for. But it's going to be farther away. And I think the art scene thing is probably going to pull you away from there. Again, every city's going to have some art, as you know. No place is going to be completely devoid of an art scene, but some it's going to be very small and others it's going to be relatively large. So Leon, I think, is probably going to have enough, but you'll have to do a lot of your own investigation. You have to work pretty hard to find that, but I think it's going to be large enough to exist here. You may have to get involved with like the Unan University or something like that to really get hooked up or with the museums. Granada, I'm sure you'll have some amount of scene. Man uh, Messiah seems like you would. Managua may be where it just makes sense because there'll be so many people. So if you can easily commute into Managua to get with people, it's going to make a lot of sense. So Managua and its associated areas that are easily commutable is another region. Uh, so you have the Highlands, Leon, and that. And then in the south, you have Rivas. This is where you get very, very uh, expat-y, um, and you're mostly looking at beach-ish communities over the, the long, sprawling Rivas area from like Popoyo near the north all the way down to San Juan del Sur in the south. Uh, this area is much more expensive. Uh, not very many Nicaraguans. If you're getting into an art scene down there, almost certainly you'd be an expat art scene and not a Nicaraguan one, so it'd be very different. You'd be basically looking at the, you know, the expat community and their hobby of doing art rather than um, something more uh, indigenous, more uh, endemic to the area, right? So it depends what you're looking for uh, and, and what's going to make you happy. And of course, you can explore the region and combine different things. If you live in Hinotepe, it's easy to get to the Riva zone to be with expats in a very enclave-like culture. It's very easy to get into Managua and be with Nicaraguans in a very, who are expats, we don't even think about them, kind of culture. So you could go either way. So I'm really looking forward to hearing about your adventures. Uh, as you guys come down with four kids homeschooling, looking at doing a homestead, I hope we get to meet up and get you guys on the show. I think that'd be uh, an adventure in and of itself and talk about your adventures in finding a place. I have a number of people who are moving down and talking about uh, getting on the show. They want to show some of the process that they go through of trying to make their way into Nicaraguan culture and find a home and find the right place to live in those kinds of things. One of the uh, most vocal and and uh, biggest supporters of the channel, Javier, has made the determination that he is now coming down. They've for a long time believed they were going to at some point, but he had to weigh retirement and scheduling in life and all those different things. And he's now at a point where he's pulling a trigger. So we're hoping to have him down here pretty sh soon and hopefully we'll get a bit of an ability to follow his process. Everyone coming down has their own unique story how they found the place, what's driving them to be here, what their connection is or lack of connection is to the place, all those. So telling some of those stories is definitely um, educational and a lot of fun. All right, let's get on to our next question. All right, our second question for the day comes in from Brent, who says, your topic du jour is crazily coincidental to a reply to a post I'm just now reading on Facebook. In reply to someone's inquiry about the possibility of finding a rental for three in Leon for $350 per month. Furnished? This is... 
in quotes, furnished, and uh, sorry, it's all in caps. I'm reading it as it's written, so bear with me. Furnished? You won't find $350 unfurnished. Housing in all areas of Nicaragua is fast, becoming more expensive than Costa Rica. And so Brent goes on to ask me if this is true, if I think this is actually the case. So no, this and Brent, absolutely, this is a raving lunatic on your Facebook group, as you're generally going to find. Absolutely, there is a few isolated Facebook groups that have some good moderation, that have some uh, good commenters. Bill from the community here runs one, for uh, example. I don't participate in any because I don't have Facebook. Like Some people say they don't have Facebook like they don't use it. I, I do not have an account on Facebook, so I'm never on there, no matter what. So anything you see posting, it's never me, ever. It's not me in some other form not involved. Uh, but I do know we have a lot of problems with some Facebook groups that they have just, they're like, they're hubs of disinformation. Often they're being run by the very people that we're trying to warn you about. And they like to run groups so that they can moderate any information that may expose them, which we heard a lot about going on in the last week. Quite a few people got caught running some scams due to some information being exposed on the channel that then caused it caused a lot of reaction that didn't make a lot of sense until you realize a lot of people are running scams against expats or potential expats. Uh, and when you expose them in the videos, people start asking questions. And those aren't questions that people want asked. And in many cases, it's questions that they didn't they were confident that no one would be asking, at least not on any scale in a public space. So you're going to find a lot of people who want to denigrate the country who want to make it scary for people to come to or others that are trying to create pressure and convince people to come down now so you can invest because you know any second it's going to be super expensive. So Costa Rica is the most expensive country in Latin America and it's been that for a bit of time and it's been a contender for that for a very long time. Costa Rica is highly desirable and a very small country and we have some videos talking about why Nicaragua is never going to or at least not in any reasonable time frame has any risk of turning into the next Costa Rica. It's not on the radar for that. It's not in line for that. There is nothing in the universe that suggests that Nicaragua would move in that direction. Is Nicaragua going to get more expensive than it is today? Likely. Is it likely to do so really quickly? No, but it could happen. Is it likely to happen within the next five years? It falls into a, it could, if you're looking at 10 years, okay, probably. But is it going to get expensive like Costa Rica? No, we have absolutely nothing that we expect will ever push Nicaragua to be like Nic Costa Rica is today. And Costa Rica continues to get more and more expensive. So while Nicaragua may start moving in that direction, Costa Rica is still accelerating away from it. Like that's important to understand. Costa Rica and much of Latin America are exp more expensive than Nicaragua, clearly, but getting more expensive than Nicaragua faster than Nicaragua is getting more expensive. So co the gap between Costa Rica and Nicaragua is still widening not shrinking. But this post is trying to imply that it's not just shrinking, but that Nicaragua is rapidly looking at overtaking Nicaragua or overtaking Costa Rica in cost of living, which is beyond absurd. Important things here on the ground is that the cost of most everything remains very flat. Some things, taxis, fuel, food, have gone up and we're starting to notice the pressures of global inflation affecting us here. But remember, our currency here is tied to the US dollar, even if somewhat loosely, and even if there is some abilities to have adjustments, we are essentially looking at a proxy for the US dollar. So the US dollar uh, and the US economy has inflated heavily, and there's essentially no way for Nicaragua not to inflate, at least to some degree along with it. Even though it's happening less than in the United States, at least I would say 1.5% less per year than in the US, it is still happening, and we're starting to feel it. Does that mean that is a crazy thing, that it's like completely destroying the economy? No, nothing like that. We do not have this inflation is crippling us the way that the U.S. and Mexico do, uh, and for different reasons. Like that's uh, Mexico, it's mostly because the peso is just so strong because of uh, how well their economy has been doing. It's just creating inflation through success. It happens. The U.S. is mostly getting inflation through COVID recovery mechanisms and other decisions that they've made. And those things are fine. Nothing particularly wrong with inflation all on its own. And here in the country, in Nicaragua, we just saw, I believe in March, uh, that we had a very large minimum wage increase. And of course, here, minimum wages are nationwide. They're not isolated to just one zone. So it doesn't cause people to shuffle around the way that it does in the United States. Uh, and so we, we saw a very big increase here, which is to reflect that inflation is going up and, and that things are getting more affluent and that good things are happening. And so we're glad to see that happening. It's a very good indicator for the country. So we're definitely seeing some increase in just the general prices. But very importantly, we're not inflating 
more than the other countries around us. We're roughly riding just the global inflation wave uh, of inflation in a very moderate way. So there's two important ways to look at we're becoming expensive. One is in absolute numbers, and these are problematic because the world doesn't work in absolute anything. There's no way to look at the cost of a single country and determine that it is expensive or cheap. I know that currency speculators want to trick you by approaching things that way because it encourages you to look at currency in a speculative way, which allows it to be more easy to emotionally manipulate you into buying shares or investment opportunities or just straight-up currency from those people. That's a sales tactic, and it's pretty effective because people like thinking in absolutes. It's easy. It's not how it works. The world of currency and prices is about relativity. If you take everything in the world and everyone inflates by 5%, well, the world didn't actually inflate. The currency did change, but everyone has gone up. So you're not paying more than someone else is. Everyone's still paying the same thing. A loaf of bread is still equal to a loaf of bread. If the U.S. was to inflate heavily, but Nicaragua was not, suddenly American bread would be more expensive than Nicaraguan bread rather than the same price. And that has happened to some degree. The U.S. is paying more for the same products than we do. That's where you get relative inflation. The United States is not as cost effective on a day. Like you know, some things we expect to have happen, like real estate, they, they're very separate. But food, you expect to have some amount of tied together because if the cost of food in the United States gets too high, we will start shipping it from here to offset that. We'll make extra profit from selling it to them. They will keep their prices under control by having a supply that doesn't cost as much. Within a single currency ecosystem, you can have inflation, and that is what most people see if you live in the United States. And these are just examples. Everyone's going through inflation right now. Europe's got some crazy inflation. You have this problem where I, I, was, I have $10, and that used to buy me an entire dinner with, with bread and eggs and cheese and a bottle of wine, and now it only buys me the eggs. Well, that's inflation. But generally, your salary also inflates in line with that under normal conditions. So the amount that you earn for an hour of your labor actually buys you more today than it did 50 years ago, 100 years ago. And you can tell this really easily by looking at technology advances and saying, well, can you get a TV for $1,000 today? Because you couldn't in equivalent money back if you look at it from a, a, a week's labor. Can you make $1,000 a week? In the United States, absolutely, you can make $1,000 a week. Okay, can you buy a nice big TV for $1,000? Absolutely. I can buy a pretty decent, good-sized TV at Walmart for $150. Okay, let's go back to when I was a child in the mid-1970s. Could you do the same thing? Well, no. Big TVs weren't even available then. A million dollars may not have gotten you one. Okay, well, could you have gotten a big TV for the time, like a 19 inch for a thousand dollars in equivalent money in, in one week's salary. No, absolutely not. You could not have all. Okay. Could you have gotten any TV for that? No, probably not. So not even close to the 150 that we do today. That would have been like easily only $30 back in the mid 1970s. And you go back even farther, eventually you're not even gonna have TVs at all. And at some point that becomes a silly comparison because they didn't exist. But you can do this with so many things in the last hundred years, cars, flights, ability to, to live abroad, um, food products, technology products, computers, you name it. And pretty soon you're like, okay, the amount that I'm earning per week, the majority of what I spend it on, I couldn't get or couldn't possibly afford Generations ago, they were buying fewer things, and those fewer things, yes, only cost so much different than what they do today, but they still cost about the same amount of your time. Is it surprising how much stuff is actually approachable today that wasn't then, even though we feel like it's gotten more expensive. A lot of those things that people say that, oh, it's so hard for kids today, sometimes that's true, but many times it is not. But you can't always compare things between generations. Often they can try to compare things like the cost of houses, and they say, well, you know, a 30-year-old in 1950 had a pretty good time buying a house, and today they cannot. Well, yes, but you cherry-picked a the greatest period for buying a house on one side, and an era when you didn't have to buy computers and iPhones and a million other little technology items. You weren't buying home media libraries. You weren't getting uh, projectors and stereo systems and you know multiple cars and all these things that people who are looking at buying a house buy first today, computers and all those things. Instead, you're starting with the house, the only th large ticket item that you could really spend money on in 1950. So, of course, people who had nowhere else to spend their money were going to buy houses that much sooner. Of course, in both cases, you could run out and have a beer. That's not a good way to look at it. All right, let's get back to this question. 
Brent wanted to know, is $350 remain reasonable for getting an apartment here in Leon? Now, it is true. $350 is going to be incredibly lean for finding a furnished apartment. We did a bunch of talking about this and showing real apartments and talked about how about $450 is about the starting point for most furnished apartments. Furnished apartments are a rarity here. You're looking at things that are coming from Airbnb in most cases, especially in the short term. So this is a specific part of the market that is very expensive and very lean. There's very little of it and and it's, and it's quite pricey because of a lack of it on the market. And uh, and you need to go into, I've got a couple of videos that dig into the economics of this, but a furnished apartment uh, comes with a lot of furniture and appliances. And these are the big ticket items that normal unfurnished apartments don't have. And because they, so if you're going to buy an oven, in Nicaragua, it is going to generally cost you about the same or more than an equivalent oven in the United States. But the land and the structure that you're going to get here in, in Nicaragua are much cheaper. So let's say you're building the same 50 square meter, 500 square foot, nice luxury two bedroom, one bath apartment in both the US and Nicaragua. Well, let's say that the construction costs and everything that you do in the United States is going to make that unit cost $100,000 to build. Well, that same unit can be built here in Nicaragua for $20,000. That includes the land, the, the construction, whatever. And the examples are contrived. Maybe they're off a bit, but you get the example. In the U.S., the actual physical structure that will become the apartment could cost five times as much as it does here in Nicaragua. Now, if you want to furnish that apartment in the United States, you're going to spend, we're going to make up a number, but you're going to get $2,000 of investment into microwave, oven, refrigerator. Maybe it's going to be 10000 Maybe it's 500 Doesn't matter. The point is you're going to put in this, you've decided in this contrived example that this $100,000 building will contain $2,000 of appliances. Great. Those exact same appliances, or basically the same appliances you're going to buy here in Nicaragua, are not likely to be $2,000. They're probably going to have a very small price premium on them if you're getting equivalent ones. Often we work really hard to get slightly less expensive ones, so typically we spend a little bit less, but you're not getting the same units when you do that. If we get the exact same units or they're essentially identical uh, competitors, you're probably going to pay a small premium and instead of spending $2,000, spend $2,200 just a little bit more, but that's significant when, when we're looking at the number for the US, that 2,000 out of $100,000 construction is 2% of the total cost. When you're here in Nicaragua, that 2,200 is out of 20,000, 11%. That is significant, five and a half times, 550% higher impact on the monthly cost, but that's just the upfront. Those items, unlike the structure itself, that 100000 or 20000 is expected to last, let's say, a century with only minor repairs. Roof, yes, maybe a little bit, but in general, you don't do a lot of repairs to that. The appliances wear out. They get abused, they get broken, they get old, they get inefficient, and so you're changing them out on a regular basis. Not every six months, but definitely every five years at minimum. Well, over the lifespan of a structure, if you're spending $2,000 every five years, which is actually reasonably easy to do when you have a rental, because people tend to abuse things, they don't know how things operate, they're a little bit rougher on things, sometimes things get stolen, all these things happen. I've seen people lose $3,000 in a one-day event in a rental, here in Nicaragua, that is so impactful when the overall prices are so low. So because that turns over all the time, it is not the 2% or 11% number that you're thinking of. It's actually far higher because it's a recurring cost every so often. So if we say, as an example, that we're going to have to replace them every five years, and as the example that we expect our structure to last 100 years, you have to amortize that. And in the one case, that's 2,000 times 20 or $40,000 you're going to spend over the lifetime of that structure. So a total of $140,000. But here, because it's $2,200, you're going to have to do that, but it's going to be $44,000 if I did my math right. I think I, something like that. And uh, then when you, am I doing that right? It might be 80. So it's 20 times, yeah, uh, no, 40,000, 40,000. 40,000 and 44,000. But the one takes the total cost up to 140,000 total over 100 years. And the other takes it up to a total of 64,000. So we started with one being 
five times as much, but we ended with it only being a little bit less than three times as much. Of course, these numbers are very fudge, but you get the idea that the appliances in the American apartment situation represent a significant, but not the majority, cost of the unit. It's about one half over the lifespan of a unit. Uh, I'm sorry, one third, half, the, half of the cost of the structure itself will be then again in appliances over its lifespan. But in Nicaragua, we expect that the lifespan cost of the appliances will be twice as much as the structure. So it is the primary cost of a short-term rental is in the appliances and other things that you do with that. Because, for example, in the United States, you're going to add on internet access for someone with something like that. In most cases, if it's a short-term, you have to. And the same thing here in Nicaragua. And while internet is generally better and cheaper here in Nicaragua, it still represents a larger percentage of your overall bill. So if you have an apartment rental for $700, $800, $1,000 in the United States, tacking on a $50 internet charge is noticeable, but very small. If you're doing the same thing in Nicaragua and you have a rental that's only $300 and you tack on that same $50 internet, maybe it's a little bit less. We'll give you a, a major discount and say it's only $30. Still, it's 10% of the total monthly recurring cost, and it's significant. So short-term rentals carry so much of a premium, and we assume in most cases that short-term rental and furnished mostly overlap. So you're going to include those things all in all circumstances together in both. So because of that, when we talk about long-term rentals in the United States, because long-term rentals generally come with a lot of appliances and the appliances are generally a cheaper uh, number, we don't tend to notice very much. But when we're coming to Nicaragua, when you switch between a short-term and a long-term rental, the difference in the monthly cost is expected to be two to 300% what it would be if it was unfurnished. Whereas in the United States, the difference would be minimal, say a 20% increase to handle the additional cost. So that's really a big thing that throws people off when you're coming down saying, well, what's this house cost to buy? What does this apartment cost to rent long term where it's not furnished? You go, wow, these prices are so cheap. And then when you hear furnished numbers, you go, well, that's still really cheap compared to what I'm used to, but it's not in all, at all cheap compared to unfurnished and long-term rentals and purchases in Nicaragua, what gives? And this is why we often recommend, certainly not always, short terms make sense for some people, but we often recommend buying all your appliances and stuff and taking them with you if you're going to move from place to place, because that's how you leverage your cost savings. You can make your things last a lot longer and make sure they're the right things for you. If you're not going to use a TV, don't spend $800 on it, which is what they often cost here. Instead, just do without and, and you save that big expense. Someone who owns an apartment like me and you need to put a TV in it for someone, I have to spend that $800 whether they are going to use it or not. And if they abuse it, which they often do, I am much more likely to have that TV get destroyed over the next five to 10 years than if someone owned it themselves and had to live with the consequences of their actions. So my own televisions often last far more than 10 years. I would not be surprised at all to get 20, 25 years out of a television that I own, but one in a rental unit I expect at most to get about five years out of. You can see where the numbers get drastically different very quickly. Those big ticket items are also the ones that tend to break a lot. So because of that, when we're looking at furnished apartments trying to get down to 350 quite difficult not out of the realm of reason but quite difficult you're looking at very small spots as someone who has apartments here in the city i can tell you that 350 is basically the amount that we have to charge for the appliances before the base cost of the apartment that does not include the building that does not include the land 350 is what it costs us to provide an apartment where the building already exists that's just uh, supplying the appliances uh, whatever management needs to be there dealing with the power putting in internet those things that alone now of course you know we're not skimping on internet we're putting in hundred dollar a month internet there's no way to get cheap when you're putting in $100, but digital nomads need good digital fiber lines. They can't be putting in some cheap cable going for the cheapest package. They're going to have problems. So it's, it's important to understand that that's why the cost is that way. We're getting really off track, but trying to explain why 350, yes, that's going to be a really lean number. I would be very surprised if they find a furnished place that they like for, for that many people at that price. That's going to be hard. But if you want an unfurnished place, you just want a long-term rental and you don't care, then that is such an easy number to hit. Full house. So prices have not gone up. This person who's making this claim, one, they don't know what the absolute prices are like in Nicaragua. Two, they don't know what the trajectory is like in Nicaragua. Three, they're just blowing smoke. 
Houses, if anything, remain going down. That's probably not true. They're mostly flat. Inflation has made it look like things have turned around a little bit, but it, you're seeing a change in the value of the currency, not a change in the value of the houses. If anything, the houses remain worth less today. And I literally had a call uh, this morning, early this morning, and we were talking about one of the supposedly highly desirable beach locations here in the country where during the pandemic, so this is just five years ago, four years ago, people were buying houses for two and $300,000 on the waterfront. And it was, they were moving to some degree on a regular basis, not a ton, obviously. Today, those same houses have been sitting on the market for a long time, often at $80,000. So even though in 2021 and 2020 and 2021, we were at what was believed to be a market low or very close to it, the prices were outstandingly low. You could pick things up for pennies on the dollar. Since that time, some major markets in the country have still collapsed by most of the value of the houses. So $300,000 houses just four years ago are now worth less than $100,000. And three years, four years ago, you could, you could reasonably sell one. It took some work, but you could. And today, at, at much less money, they're just sitting on the market because the interest in them isn't there. Now, I have uh, talk to some people. I'm hoping that we're going to get to go see some of those and actually put them on. So those who are like, Ooh, is this a good deal? I don't know if they're even a good deal at that price. If they actually, I can tell you, they're definitely not a great deal at that price because they would have sold if they were those of us who are in country at $80,000. If that's a good deal, we'll know it. We'll run and buy them. No problem. Just like that. We'll go get one. But we know that there's problems that make them not very valuable, but they're getting pretty close. At some point they have to be worth the money. Right? Whether it's 70 or 60 or 50, they, they can only come down so far before the land is just worth it for the long haul. So at some point, they will start to sell. But at 80, they're struggling, apparently. That's what we hear. So we're going to go down and see some and hopefully expose them some so you guys can get out who might actually have a good connection uh, with those that like say, that's just the house I was looking for. And I'm willing to spend a little bit to lock it up now. Uh, take some risk. Uh, how much can I lose? It's 80,000. Okay, I can take that amount of risk. Well, maybe it's going to make sense for you. So we'd like to show them and help those people get some exposure because they're having problems even getting the word out because there's no one looking at the market. But I do have an audience who tends to look. And as always, I don't sell any of these houses. I just like looking at houses. I like finding out how much things cost. This is how I generate a lot of knowledge about the market is going out and talking to real people, finding out what they actually have and showing them to you when I can. And that builds information and, and makes you guys more educated. So that's all we do. So anything we show on here always, if it's for sale, uh, you're welcome to go contact the people and talk directly. Don't go through an agent. Don't go through me. Go directly. That's the only way to do it. Talk to people, work out a deal. Anyway, so the costs keep going down. So here you're still able to get full houses, two bedroom, one bath for 145. You can still get really nice places for 250 to 300. You can still get the luxury premium gated community things here in Leon for 400. You can still get them in the 200s down in like Ciudad Sandino, which is still really nice and up and coming. You can still buy between 16,000 and 32,000 in nice gated or nearly gated developments. Uh, things on the beach are still coming down in price. We're, we're looking at properties I'm supposed to go see this week that have dropped from 75,000 to 45,000 and still no one is going to look at them, right? Just, just off the view, in sight of the water and nothing is selling. Now, some people have said, oh, we went and the prices are much higher than, than you said, Scott, but no one that we've, as far as we know, they didn't talk to the real owner. There's always a real estate agent in between inflating the prices, of course. And I've seen the place that we're going to look at at higher prices from real estate agents, but I know the person selling it and I know the price that they're actually asking is 45,000. And we're not going to put it on the show. I know you guys are really excited to see what we're going to look at for 45,000. And I do have someone who's one of my neighbors and is already going with me to look at it. So until she turns it down, we're not going to show any of it on the show. But if no one that is uh, looking at it uh, currently, because I'm just getting to see it because they're looking at it. So I have to, I, I'm under a kind of non-disclosure until that time, but if they don't if they decide not to take it, happily put it on the show and uh, you guys can decide to go after it if you want. Uh, but these prices are super low. The point is that we keep hearing, and I've been told several times in the last two weeks that my prices, that so many people call me crazy for how low I say the prices are, that many people are telling me that actually I'm too high in many cases. Now, whether they're accurate or not is very hard to determine, but there are a fair number of people who think that I'm still 
getting gringo priced a little bit, which is absolutely reasonable, and that there's still more digging into market value to do that things are still costing less. My lawyer is one of those people who tells us, we'll look at a property, we'll be like, oh, I bet at 80,000, this is a good deal. And they're like, absolutely do not offer them over 40. You're still off by 100%. Like, holy cow, we're off by so much. So there really are these cheap things out there. And if anything, they're getting cheaper. If they have furnishings, they're in high demand because there are so few of them. By all means, it could be expensive. But anyone who's telling you that we're getting more expensive, that's not true. That we're approaching Costa Rica in some way, that is anything but the case. That it's we're looking at it more expensive than Costa Rica in the future, that's insane. There's nothing like that happening in Nicaragua whatsoever. Nicaragua remains the cheapest country in the region, except for possibly Colombia. There's always a competition there. We have completely different pricing structures, so it's always difficult to evaluate them one compared to another. Your lifestyles would make them quite a bit different, so you can't just compare apples to apples. But overall, we are the cheapest in this region. We're the cheapest in, the, in North America on the continent. That is not changing. There's no trajectory making that change. If anything, we are getting cheaper by comparison to the other countries as their prices keep going up. And most of them are not going up that much. They're just going up more than us. If anything, we might still be going down. We think we're pretty much at the trough. There's very little room to keep going down. But we say that and there's always the possibility it's going to get just a little bit more depressed. And it's funny because some people say it's so expensive, no one can do anything. Other people in the same types of forums post how things are so cheap that it's a complete collapse and it's a failed state and uh, and it's insane how low it is and it's an indicator of things. Now, when you have one person who's telling us that the market is going up and up and up in a meteoric rise, and we have another person who's telling us that it's in utter collapse and everything's going to fail, they can't both be telling the truth. In fact, we know one of them is lying and chances are we can actually expect that both of them are. One, very few people actually have any real visibility into the market to make that kind of prediction, but also, it is much more likely that what we observe on the ground, which is that things remain mostly at a steady state, some things do go up, some things go down, but mostly small little pockets in small little numbers is what's actually going on. There's some groups that are trying to sell homes and so they want to either let you know that prices are really low and maybe you should look while others want to get more out of their properties that they have so they pretend that things are moving fast and that the prices will be high so that hopefully people believe them and when they hear high prices, they fall for it. Everyone's got a different opportunity to manipulate the market and you kind of have to think about how are people potentially using price belief as a mechanism to gain something that they want. And a lot of people just have a desire to make the market look good for them. Others want to pretend that the house that they own is worth more money so they can brag about it more. Some people want to claim tax deferments. Some people have no interest in the market whatsoever directly as a market, and they want to make the country look bad or good, depending on what they say. But it's difficult to know if making it inexpensive makes it look good to the group that they're interested in or making it expensive makes it look good. like you just don't know. Everyone has their own ulterior motives, so you have to be careful. But that's a lot of that is what we find in these forums is a lot of people who have no idea. We actually, in most cases, don't know if these people have ever been to Nicaragua, know anything about the market, or are actually researching anything. Many of those forums are full of random people, sometimes paid to come in and spread disinformation. We've seen a lot of that recently. And there's a lot of people, especially in real estate and in uh, law firms that specialize in real estate, they go after expats and they want to engender panic or generate interest or who knows what their particular angle is. But there is a lot of this that is the norm here. So understanding that is important. Now, of course, you can say the same thing about me. What angle do I potentially have? Am I bringing you real information? And you should be asking yourself that. Of course, you should be questioning your sources. But my observations are that very few things are selling. Very few people are actually down literally buying houses. Some people come down, a very small number come down and speculate. They look at houses and go, well, I want, I would like that. I'd be really interested. But those that are truly putting up money and purchasing a place, they exist, but they are a rarity. Uh, and, and we're just starting to see the interested people come down and start to do long-term rentals in the hope of making good decisions. Because that's generally what you see first, right? People who are really serious buyers, people who are looking to be invested in the market and stay here for the long haul, not just do some speculation and move on. And often people in these, these forums are playing to the speculators. They, don't, they know that people who come down and do their due diligence aren't gonna be fooled, but they know that there's a lot of speculators looking in Nicaragua and if you tell them that the price is good right now, they go, okay, so it's really cheap. And then you say, but it's gonna be more than Costa Rica soon. They go, I'm gonna make a million overnight. And, and once you get that emotion in your head, it's hard to give it up. And people will often speculate on properties and say, well, it was worth millions before, 
but it wasn't. But it's easy to make websites that make it look like it was. And so they create this feeling that, well, at one point it was worth a ton, now it's in collapse, it'll come right back. And people are saying, oh my gosh, it's almost up to Costa Rica already. And if then they find something that's a deal, they, they jump on it because they don't realize that it's all completely fake. And so it's really easy to manipulate speculators who don't come down to the country and or do, but don't get out of the, the expat enclaves where they can have this message that's just repeated to them a lot over and over again. And then it becomes very difficult to discern, to determine what is reality. But if you get out and drive around, talk to real people, look at buying property yourself firsthand, you get the real picture very quickly. So in hard numbers, could a family come into Leon, rent a place and live for $350 a month? Yes, that is doable. Is it a little bit difficult to do if you need furniture and all that stuff? Yes, it'll be a little bit difficult. That's going to take some time to research, but definitely doable. What do real rentals look at look like for someone who's in that price range without furnishings? Probably you could get by closer to $175 per month without furniture, but it's going to be a very lean place. But getting up towards $200 or $250, especially, you could get some pretty nice places. If you want to spend as high as $500, you're looking at some serious luxury in absolutely high-end gated communities with you know private security and all kinds of things like that. How much will furniture add on to that? Easily. $150 to $300 per month, depends on the size of the place, depends on the type of furniture, depends on the amenities and such, but those are kind of normal numbers. So uh, on one side, yes, $150 you could get by, but you know, getting closer to $300 is more realistic, and if you're going to be furnished, then the $350 number will be pretty lean. Hopefully that answers the question. If you have some real examples that they should look at, I'd be happy to look at stuff and talk about them or even go look at them and film. Uh, it's always interesting to see what housing does cost, should cost, could cost, what your opportunities are and where people are just hoping that people aren't doing their due diligence. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. As always, it would be amazing if you would link to this somewhere on social media, let people know about the show, tell a friend or family member, and at the end, I'm going to pop up some extra videos, but we're coming up in the next few days on something really important. So we are, on this coming Friday, going to be three years to the day from when we first landed in Nicaragua for our permanent adventure. Now, we lived here previously. It's not the beginning of our Nicaragua adventure, but it was the beginning of we had given everything up and moved down. So when we show the videos at the end, they're going to be linking back in the next few days to the final days of our time in Nicaragua and soon our first days, uh, I'm sorry, our final days in America and our first days in Nicaragua. So that is something that you can follow along with using these videos at the end of the, of the little screen we put up at the end to help you discover the adventure we've had four years ago, three years ago, two years ago, one year ago. Uh, I think it's really cool. So if you would not uh, skip over those and actually click on one, that'd be great. But I will see all of you tomorrow. And here we go, four videos, when they're available, we make them for one year ago, two year ago, three year ago, and four year ago. So at this point, if they exist on that day, 2020, 2021, 2022, and 2023, the second one, 2021, is the video for three years ago, and as we did our final preparation for moving to Nicaragua.